Hey guys and gals, running enthusiasts, uh, before we get to this video on A-Lactic, just want to um, show uh, where my subscribers and not subscribers views are coming from. This is from the last 28 days, and um, if you've been watching these videos recently, you've noticed this actually has moved a little bit. So um, thank you for those of you guys that have hit the subscribe button and are watching um, via subscription as opposed to just not subscribing. But if you are still watching this, which is still the bulk of my audience who are not subscribed, and you're finding this helpful, please think about giving it a, um, a the subscribe button a hit. Um, it really does just uh, show support for the channel. It allows it to be um, kind of in other people's suggestions if they're looking for other things or, or watching other feeds. So I would really appreciate it if you are watching this and are finding it helpful that you would hit that subscribe button. Um, I'd put out about three to five videos a week on different aspects of running. Um, so if you're someone who's really into running, um, please think about hitting that subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. Hi everyone and welcome back to this video on how to set up your general prep um, workouts for the cross country season. Um, we've gone through now all the critical workouts and now we're moving on to the important workouts. Workouts that you definitely still need to do. They do serve a very big purpose but they need to be sort of penciled in around your your critical workouts just because of order of importance and things like that. So we are really changing everything up on you with this video type this workout type I mean we've got previously we've only been looking at aerobic workouts which makes sense we've talked about the specificity of different things how much of the energy comes from um, the aerobic system in the 5k um, we've dealt with vo2 max testing and intervals long runs recovery runs at aerobic threshold we are going the complete opposite end of things today we are going as fast as we possibly can and that seems kind of counterintuitive for uh, a cross-country distance type season setup why would we want to run as fast as we possibly can for very short bursts? And we'll kind of get into all the reasons why you would do this. But again, just kind of consider this overall idea. Racing is all about how you can get yourself or who you're coaching from point A to point B as fast as possible. It's not about how far you can run. It's about how fast you can run when it comes down to it, specific to the event. And these types of workouts help to transition those things and work on some of the things that you typically get overlooked with distance kids. It's not usually what they naturally go for, but it's sort of an analogy that I always bring up when kids first start asking, you know, why are we doing this and that kind of thing. If you were a really smart kid in, say, math, and you're on your SAT and you, you've you gone out and you've gotten uh, 700 on the SAT in your um, math side of things, but you've only gotten, say, a 500 on the English side. Well, that's only a score of 1,200. That's still pretty decent. It'll get you into, you know, decent colleges and that kind of thing. But if you want to up your game, where are you going to spend the most time is on that English side, the, the 500, not the 700. But in doing so, we need to do it to not lose our strength, right? In this analogy, you don't want to overstudy so much for English that your math 700 falls. We want to get our kids speed to a point to where it accents what makes them great, their aerobic side, their, their distance base, and that kind of thing. So the alactic runs are how we're going to do that. We're going to talk about design, um, why we do this, where these fit into your training year and everything. So we need to think like a sprinter is key to improve force production, ground contact time, and running economy. Some of those things make sense for a distance coach, probably running economy, but ground contact time and force production, we usually think about from our, our sprint coaches. You hear things like that. We have to adapt aspects of that to get our kids faster and some of these other things that we're going to talk about here. This is our 2016 team from Wharton High School. The first team, um, we placed top 10 that year um, after not advancing out of our from our district meet in eight straight years. So this is the team that kind of changed the game for us. This was before I started working on A-Lactic work, and I really wish I had because we had a lot of middle distance kids on this team. This young man ended up going 157 at one point. Middle distance runner we had right here. This was a young man who was under 430 as a sophomore. Um, middle distance kid, middle distance kid, middle distance kid. I was actually, I, this would have really served this these kids great to kind of accent things, but also our, our pure distance kids in the group right here and right here definitely could have also benefited from it to kind of gain from it. So, and this is our, our kind of dean of all things um, Dis distance, track and field, everything. Wesley Newton at um, Morton High School. He's uh, he's my mentor, kind of chatting with the kids right after their race that year. I am Kyle Ajakino. I'm the head boys cross country and track coach at Wharton High School, and I have been. Um, this will be my seventh year in cross country and just completed my seventh year in track. Um, some of my credentials are there on the screen if you want to take a closer look. 
All right, so the workouts in general prep. We've already gone through all the critical workouts. Those, um, The links for those workouts in the description down below. I would look at those first. Critical are the ones that are vitally important to success. We're moving on to important. Important workouts are obviously important. We wouldn't um, do them if they weren't important. Um, but we need to kind of make sure that these are the critical, these are the important, keep those in your mind. These workouts are still very important to XC 5K success, but less though than the critical ones, okay? You should still be doing these. Take care of these first, take care of these second. Don't take care of these at all in general prep. These special endurance, intensive tempo, and extensive tempo, which actually bleeds over a little bit into here. I'll briefly mention that in a later video. These workouts are not unimportant for the entire year. These are not important for the general preparation season, but later on, when we get a little bit closer to the last 9 to 11 weeks of the season, these do come into play. This is just general prep, your summer training type of things. Okay, so that's what we are here today. As always, we're going to talk about our racing metrics. Um, if you don't know what it takes to win a race, then you really don't know what you're studying for at all, if you want to think about it that way. If you don't know what's on the test, you're probably not going to do very well. So first up, um, study that was released by Ingham in 2008, I've talked about... Um, you know, quite often in these videos, um, they looked at a lot of different people over a long period of time, looked at a lot of different things, not just VO2 max, but um, fastest 400 time. Um, they looked at body composition, like fat, um, length of, you know, leg length to body length. They looked at a bunch of different things, and they found that in the 5K, the biggest single indicator of who won 94.3% of the time was who had the most developed VVO2 max. We're not really going to be talking about VVO2 max here, or VO2 max here today, but that is the, an important thing to realize. That is why those are in more of those critical workouts um, today, and we'll talk about where uh, Alactic Works fits in here in a minute. Um, from the distance curriculum from the USA track and field, um, they they found that 97% um, your your 5K is run at 97% of your VO2 max, which is why these are so closely associated. VO2 max is so closely associated with winning the 5K. And what we're dealing with here today is really looking here at the energy supply share. What of the three, and it's kind of a misnomer to say that there are three energy systems. There are three things that contribute to the one energy system we have, because these are all turned on all at the same time. Um, but we kind of, in our minds, kind of separate them into three different. So this was released, um, a study done by Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman in 2018. They work a lot with the IAAF, and we'll look at this a little bit more extensively later on. But in short, the available ATP that's just sitting in your muscles, and then the phosphocreatin system supplies... Um, Phosphocreatin system is the same thing as the alact. Th these together, the available ATP and the phosphocreatin, this makes up the alactic um, energy supply contributing to your energy system. Makes up 4% of the energy from the 5K. Anaerobic glycolytic is 10%, and the aerobic system is 86%. And again, this is again that idea of the counterintuitive nature of this. This is only 4%. Now, we don't want to throw away 4%, but why are we devoting time to only 4%? If we get all of this perfect, we still have, if you think about it, um, from a grading perspective, we still have a pretty good A. We have a 96%. But the idea is we're going to train this, and we'll talk about this later on, not because of the supply of energy that we get from this, but in the other contributions, the other adaptations we get from training this system. And I'll show you how you can, on a day that you're training this, still get a lot of this also in terms of the order of things and how you sort of play it out. Where do alactic runs fit in? We've been dealing with down here, our aerobic threshold, our long and recovery runs were down in here, our VO2 max testing and intervals were right in here, 98 to 101%. Um, as we're dealing with it, we're later on going to talk about lactic threshold. We are on the opposite end of the scale. So I know this is a little bit daunting, it looks a little bit, but just kind of focus in on the key aspects here. Um, this is from USATF distance curriculum. VO2 max, two mile pace is right here. 3K, 5K, very close to VO2 max. 10K is a little bit longer and slower. Marathon pace. These are all the aerobic workouts from VO2 max to the right. Everything from the left is anaerobic. So we are almost off the scale as fast as humans can possibly go. Anaerobic, alactic. All the way off to the left here. This is almost, um, the red indicates anaerobic contribution. If you look right here, not to get too into this chart, um, the green number is how much percent from a, a particular race or intensity is coming from the aerobic system. Green here, green here. The red, which again, red indicates anaerobic, is the percent that comes from the anaerobic system. So obviously, the further left you get, the more um, intense, the faster the race. Like the 800 is going to be a little, it's going to be more anaerobic um, than say the 5K is. Okay. So that's the idea here. So we are way, way off here 
to the left as fast as we can possibly go and there's that inverse relationship if this is super fast super intense well then it's going to have to be pretty short we talked about that when we, we talked about VO2 max intervals and we talked about how you can get more than two miles worth of this by splitting up the workouts into intervals. Same concept's going to apply here with slightly different terminology called repetitions. But again, we are looking at um, where does this all sort of fit in. And again, just keep in mind this idea of if you're um, trying to get from point A to point B the fastest, we've got to be fast. So this is what I was talking about before. This is from Dr. Matter and Dr. Hartman's study that was released in 2018. It's just sort of a bigger breakdown of different distances and the percents from the three different energy systems. Now, Matter and Hartman do a lot of their stuff. Um, I believe they're both um, uh, based in Germany, actually. They work a lot with the IAAF, um, another, you know, the international um, track and field um, organization. So basically, this... Cre this is cretin phosphate. They abbreviate it a little bit differently than we do in this country. Phosphocretin is really the way you look at it. But this is the alactic system, again, the combination of ATP and cretin phosphate in here. Um, anaerobic lactic, that's what they call over there what we call anaerobic glycolo glycolytic. And then the aerobic system, just to kind of break this all down as we look at this. So the biggest... Okay, so the shorter the race, as I was just saying, the shorter the distance, the bigger contribution from the ATP, cretin phosphate, alactic system. And obviously, as I said, it's almost entirely anaerobic, very little aerobic. Um, the shortness of it means that, yeah, there's going to be a little bit of this developing, but not enough to really mess things up. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. The idea that all these energy systems are on all the time, but the idea that just sitting there watching this, you're developing some energy anaerobically producing acid. Because if you weren't producing acid, the aerobic system wouldn't work. We talked about this a lot in some subsequent videos um, that I would recommend taking a look at. But don't get scared by this. Okay, the idea being is the big contributors from the anaerobic um, glycolytic or lactic system come from down here. This is what sometimes scares distance coaches um, producing acid. This is high acid, the percentage from it, okay? Um, this really isn't all that much in the grand scheme of things. So this is what we're looking at right here, short kind of burst of energy. And um, we'll find that it's really from 30 to 60 meters where you see that these energy system is the biggest contributor. And again, the 5K is all the way down here, and you would think we would only be working all aerobic. This is the idea of this is a important workout, not critical. You need to get these in. The recommendation is about 20 of these sessions per year, which means maybe two to three per month. Um, if you're taking, you know, maybe a month or two off between seasons and that kind of thing. So just kind of keep that in mind, and I'll just again point this out that even distance races are about. Uh, um, who can get from point A to point B fastest. Typically, when we think about that, we think about the 100, the 200, the 400. It's not who can run the farthest. If that was the case, it would be something completely different, right? Any As distance coaches, how do we make our kids faster while not hurting what makes them great? Their overall aerobic side. That's the idea here in this whole scenario. So don't be afraid of this, and I'll kind of show you why you don't have to be afraid of this a little bit later. I just want to talk a little bit about running economy, probably where distance coaches are the most comfortable. There are really two aspects of running economy because it just overall means how do you use the least amount of energy getting from one place to the other, which again is going to make us faster if we have more fuel over these longer periods of time if we're not using a ton of energy. So the first aspect comes from what we're usually more comfortable with as distance coaches, which is energy conservation and mechanics. Okay, basically this improves with any type of running, right? The idea being is the human body really gets better at doing things it is exposed to often, right? Um, this idea of if you do something quite often, you get really good at it. The idea of just walking around, if you're just walking around mindlessly, you know, you, someone calls you or whatever, sometimes people pace, they just kind of walk around, you're not really thinking about it, and you just kind of get better at it the more you do it, but the first time you're doing something, the first time you jump on a bike, or roller skates, or really try and run, um, swim, whatever, it, it's really challenging because your body just doesn't have the overall idea of how to do it, and just running will make you more economical, Okay. This takes a lot of time to improve to kind of get it to this point of it more being um, 
hardwired into your nervous system of how to do it, okay? And it's kind of hard to measure. I don't really necessarily recommend measuring this a lot with your kids. The idea being is just over time, they're going to get better, and you're just going to kind of see it. You can test it with something called a VCR test or a critical velocity or the, the velocity at which you reach critical pace. This is 30 minutes to 60 minutes, as fast as you can possibly go or as far as you can go really in, in that, and you kind of measure it. Hard tempo runs, as they get better at really kind of fast tempo runs, um, that kind of shows running economy in this aspect of conservation and mechanics. Reasons for improving this, and this is really more something we're going to talk about a little bit later, but I know that a lot of coaches understand this a little bit more to kind of introduce this. Muscle memory, which is sort of just a catch-all term for just your, your nervous system gets better at doing it. We kind of talked about that already. As you do it, you get better at the mechanics of it. Um... You know, the first time you're running, you know, your arm carriage or your knee lift, a lot of these things are just not great, and just kind of doing it um, in any general way can make it a little bit more improved mechanically. Fuel storage and sites, as your body's, um, as your muscles in your body start working, your body realizes, well, crap, we're doing a lot of energy use with these muscles. I'm going to store more fuel in and around these working muscles, more fat, more carbohydrates. That makes you more economical because your body doesn't have to move it as quickly to get to the working muscles. And just the general aerobic improvements we've talked about in previous videos that are in the description. More enzymes, mitochondria, you can produce more energy um, and that kind of thing. And you just get a little bit more economical because you have these structures in place to do it faster and more efficiently. Um, the key to this type of running economy is... is overall running in time, but has the greatest improvements with um, tempo runs and long runs. We've talked about it in the long run. We'll talk about it in tempo run in a later video. This is what we're really dealing with today, and it's what makes us a little more com uncomfortable as distance coaches, because this is terminology you hear a lot from your sprint coaches, right? This is muscle elasticity and ground contact time, all things that we do need to know about, because, you know, we usually think about this when we're dealing with, you know, our jumpers, our sprinters, um... Our, our short middle distance runners, our 400 meter runners, those kind of things. But if you really think about it, where's the bigger impact going to be? A race that is 100 meters or a race that is 5,000 meters with the muscle elasticity and ground contact. If we can re reduce ground contact time, ground contact time is bad. When your foot is on the ground, bad things can happen. It's, it's slow. You're stopping yourself. And injuries happen when you hit the ground, not when you're in the air. We want to reduce the amount of time we're on the ground. And we want our muscles to be elastic, as we're going to mention here. It's basically free energy that when your muscle is elastic. If we're contacting the ground for 5,000 meters, 3.1 miles here in, in a 5K, we better figure out a way to make our muscles elastic and reduce our ground contact time because we have more of it than any other race without hurting these other aspects that we're talking about with the aerobic system. So this improves by creating specific muscle responses to max efforts. Okay, we talked about this is as fast as you can go. This is max efforts, short period of time. Okay, the, this includes improvements to the central nervous system, sending signals, muscle use, and muscle response. This also takes a lot of time, but only improves when given specific training responses. Okay, these are essentially these are all plyometric type exercises with elasticity and ground contact time. This type of running, even though it's just really short and really fast, is plyometrically based. Okay. So, like over here, just running improves this aspect of running economy. This means you need something very specific to improve this aspect of running economy in your runners, okay? So, plyometrics, jump-based, shock-based training to get a specific response out of your muscles at max effort. Reasons for the improvement? It's all of these three things together equaling the last part. So, it's central nervous system response. You are demanding that your brain and your spinal cord send these signals very fast to these very large muscle groups. This is something your body naturally does not want to do. It is energy expensive to use big muscle groups. Your body wants to use the least amount of energy to get the maximum amount of effect. Calories are survival. This has to be trained. The central nervous system does not want to do this inherently. Okay, it's the idea why younger runners just look a little bit less coordinated. The central nervous system response needs to be there. Another reason for this in younger runners, and you need time for it to, to look a little bit better, is the muscle coordination. So the central nervous system sends the response to the muscles. That's the first part. 
There's all these things that make this better. Um, the more you do it, there's more neural pathways. Um, they wrap what's called myelin around your your um, nervous system, your nerves to insulate the electricity so that it sends it faster. There's all these things that make this faster with more quick responses. But then the muscles have to get used to it too once this is kind of built up. The muscle coordination. Obviously, your muscles are actually a group of muscle fibers all together working in unison, and they need to get practice in coordinating their efforts. How do we work together within this one muscle, all the fibers firing together as the central nervous system demands this response from us? Those things get added together with muscle synchronization, right? Muscle synchronization, not just, you know, your your quadriceps working together, but your hamstrings and your, and your calves and all these muscles synchronizing their motion, adding up, working together to equal muscle elasticity and reduce ground contact time. So as all of these three things get added together, muscle elasticity first. So this is sort of like if you ever see, this is things like muscle stiffness, um, ground preparation. This is why when it looks like a sprinter is running or a jumper, it looks like they're just bouncing. It looks like, you know, it's almost effortless that, you know, they just, they just, pop right back up when when they hit the ground and and it just kind of springs into that next step you know um at our school um our sprint coach named Heenan Taint fantastic sprint coach and when he kind of runs around the kids just kind of say it, it just looks literally like he's almost prancing or hopping or it just it doesn't look like he's running because he gets so much free energy from his muscle elasticity and the real interesting thing about this is that is the case um there's been a decent amount of studies that have shown that muscle elasticity is free energy, right? It's not kinetic. It's simply the stretch shortening cycle. Your muscles hit the ground and they use the energy that's going into the ground and it comes back through um, the stretch shortening cycle and these different parts of your, your muscles. Um, muscle spindles are involved. The Golgi tendon organ is involved. All these different things kind of go together to make a kinetic chain of energy of muscle elasticity. And essentially what these studies have found is that you can get th that energy is 100% free. There's no extra muscle activity happening. It is simply traveling through your your muscles more effectively to get more energy moving into the next step. Almost 30% of the mu energy can come from this. That is a huge chunk of economics of running being used here if your muscles are more elastic kind of going through it. You use less energy because it is simply what you're giving to the track, what you're giving to the surface that you're pushing down into, you're getting it back. So that's the first thing that we're getting here and reduced ground contact time. I don't know why I put two equal signs here. Maybe it's for two different things. Um, reduced ground contact time. So as you hit the ground, you spring into the next step. You get your foot off the ground more quickly. That's the fast part of running. It's not when you're hitting the ground. It's when you're pushing into that next step and reducing the amount of time that your foot is on the ground is critical to that. Um, Again, I'm referencing this um, a study here that basically it says, um, well, well, first off, the key to getting the body used to fast, high power bouts of running throughout the year, recommended we need about 20 sessions of these per year. Reduce ground contact time. I thought I'd put it, yeah. Um, this only improves with max um, speed and has max speed improves all other sub max paces improved. So elasticity adds to the ground contact time, reduced ground contact time. One of the things you really look at more so from 100 meter runners is how much time they're spending on the ground. That improves max speed as max speed improves this idea of all subsequent paces below it. So the idea being, if you think back to when we did our video on VO2 max testing, we said we improve VO2 max, we test it, and the slower paces kind of get faster. This is the case with max speed too. All those sub-maximal paces get better, and what has been found is it's all the way out to the marathon. If you reduce ground contact time, and it's a straight percentage, you reduce your ground contact time by 2%, your marathon time is improved by 2%. Your 5K time is improved by 2%. This is important, but again, it is not. Nowhere in here did I talk about the percentage of the energy that you're really getting from the ATP and creatine phosphate, the alactic system. It's because of this that we're dealing with. The improvements to the muscles and the ground contact time. That's why you do this, so that when you have to go in the middle there, you're using less energy. And this also deals with your final push. When you can recruit all of these muscles the way you can. This is why you see, you'll see two kids, they're in the 5K, they're right next to each other, and all of a sudden one just takes off at a pace that the other one cannot handle and just looks like, wow, that one kid is just so much faster. 
aerobically they're both the same, but that second kid who takes off probably has a more developed alactic system, not because of the energy you got from it, because they got very little in the race, 4%, but what are they getting in terms of a reduced fatigue to the, the aerobic system because they have all of these things using less energy, and then when they need to recruit those muscles, coordinate them, and synchronize them, they can use all of them all together, and that's the idea of max speed. Even though it's a, you know, it's the idea of you're running much slower than this in the races, it improves all those paces all the way out to the marathon. So, a lot going on there. The idea being is two different parts of running economy. We're looking at muscle elasticity and ground contact time with the alactic system, and these are all the reasons why you would do it um, as a distance coach for your 5K runners. But this is the area where coaches get scared. What about lactic acid doesn't that hurt me as a distance runner producing too much lactic acid at the wrong part of the year we've talked about this those unimportant workouts that we dealt with earlier on they're not unimportant at the right time but we're talking about doing this in general prep what about the lactic acid if you ever wondered this is what lactic acid looks like okay so anaerobic workouts are typically associated with lactic acid production produced when glucose is burned at fast rates in the cell cytoplasm. I'm trying not to, you know, give you a 100% a refresher on your freshman biology class, but just so you know, this is that liquid that's in and around the cells. Mitochondria are not involved with any anaerobic type energy production because they are without acid and mitochondria as the powerhouse of the cell use oxygen. Okay, so that's what generally anaerobic workouts are associated with. Okay, that is the one issue that we deal with when we have anaerobic workouts. So increasing acidity reduces pH levels, which mitochondria and enzymes hate at high levels. We talked about a little bit earlier. Mitochondria use the acid for their own um, energy production with the curb cycle, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but they can only use so much. Okay, they use it and then it goes away. But if they're just sitting there and they're trying their hardest, all these little mitochondria are just trying to churn out energy aerobically, but they just can't get rid of it, they can get damaged, and so can the enzymes. They hate these high levels of acid-reduced pH levels. And this is the problem right here. Lactic acid only lasts in your body for about a quarter second, and then your body splits it right here between this red and white line. From the red line over, your body shuttles this back into your liver, and it can reproduce more carbohydrate out of it over time. This is the problem. This is the free radical. This is the H plus ion um, that I've talked about before. This is what is the jelly leg feeling that comes from running anaerobically for too long. Okay, This is what your mitochondria do use for its own respiration to produce energy aerobically, but this are part of what it uses, not the only thing. But this is the issue. But as you can see, this is very small. This is very big. So we measured the lactate when we're kind of taking a prick of blood or when we're, we're measuring a lot of these things because they come in a one-to-one -one ratio. We used to think that the lactate was the problem. It's not. It's the acid, the free ion that breaks off that is the problem. This can cause a little bit of swelling and a little bit of discomfort, but not, not really. This is not what's going to ever stop you. This is what stops you, this little guy over here. Okay, the potential reduction in aerobic fitness from the mitochondria and the enzymes being hurt from it um, and the t um, fitness and timing of anaerobic peaks. We talked about earlier on. We do those workouts later on in the year with the last 9 to 11. We're dealing with 20 plus weeks in general prep. Um, so these two things together, the potential reduction of aerobic fitness and timing of anaerobic peaks make many distance coaches afraid of any anaerobic work. But as we talked about, there are two different ways you get energy anaerobically, right? However, there is no, zero, no acid production with the anaerobic alactic system, okay? None of that, okay? Zero, nothing, not even a little bit from the anaerobic alactic system, the ATP and the creatine phosphate. Okay. Now, earlier on, we saw that there is that energy system that's being used if you're doing 30 meters or 60 meters. But then, you sitting here watching this, you're also producing energy anaerobically with glycogen, with glucose, and you're producing acid just kind of sitting here. And you're not really doing anything. You're obviously not feeling anything. So, that's always happening. Again, the idea that the um, mitochondria do use this. If you just completely shut this down, you would not like the result because eventually your mitochondria wouldn't be producing energy and you wouldn't last very long, right? So with this energy system, which we can target and only stress for the most part in this workout, you will not have this potential negative 
okay, what a lot of distance coaches are afraid of, of hurting the mitochondria and the enzymes that hurt your overall aerobic fitness, and you're not going to start tapping into the anaerobic glycolytic system, not really, you're not really going to be stressing it to hurt your peaking cycle, so just consider that, you do not have to worry about that, and we're getting our kids faster, and I'll talk about how you can make this um, a bit of an aerobic day too later on, so no lactic acid involved in this energy system at all. All right, so again, I'm not trying to go through and completely redo all of your biology class when you were um, a freshman in high school, but I think this is important to know. This is the ATP to ADP energy replacement, and this really kind of makes sense for all of this, okay? So, don't want to go too, too crazy with this, but essentially we all know that ATP is the only fuel that your body uses. Not so many people know that what happens is your body is constantly using it and it creates ADP, and then it's a cycle of using this, recharging this, using ATP, and um, recharging ADP in a cycle. This is all those three energy systems. This is all they're doing all the time, okay? So ATP is triple phosphate, okay? Here's the A. That doesn't change. And then you have three phosphates. So here's what ATP it doesn't really look like this, but essentially this is what it looks like, right? Okay, so this is step one. You've got this sitting in your cell, and then boom, you start a race. What happens is your body splits this last phosphorus, the last of the triple phosphates, off, and this just kind of splits off, and that splitting of this molecule creates the energy that goes to the cells that produces muscle contraction. Okay, so this is like step two. It splits off, boom, we've got energy, and then we've got ADP. This is now a double phosphate, not a triple phosphate. So this is all sort of lonely off the end. Your body doesn't use this for anything. It's completely without energy. Okay, this is where the three different energy replacement systems or the three different aspects of your energy system kind of comes involved. So it goes around the circle. We've got this uncharged ATP. Now you eat something, you have the ability to create the extra, to turn it back into triple phosphate, the extra phosphate. It's coming from the food that you're eating. It produces, you know, the energy from the different energy systems. We then recharge. We put this little phosphate onto this one, and we've got ATP again, and just kind of keeps going around and around and around in this cycle. That's how ATP is created from ADP, and how ADP is created by producing energy from splitting off the last phosphate from ATP. That is essentially all your body is doing. You got this, the available ATP, boom, splits off. We've got energy, uncharged, bring food in with our different energy production ways, and we've got ATP again. That's all we're doing here. It's pretty simple and pretty complex all at the same time, okay? So the aerobic system, there's three different ways we can do this. The aerobic system uses glucose or fat. You can use protein, but your body doesn't like it. I've got a whole um, video on um, fuel sources down in the description you might want to take a look at, but glucose and fat primarily, and it produces... 36 ATP molecules using the mitochondria, enzymes, aerobic enzymes, and the H plus ion we talked about before that is being created from anaerobic glycolytic energy production in, that's already in your cells. It's called the curb cycle, but it's very slow, okay? It kind of slingshots the H plus ions using the enzymes to kind of charge it, um, slingshots the H plus ions through the cell membranes of the mitochondria, and that's how you produce the 36 ATP. It's called a, the curb cycle. It is the slowest of the three ways of recharging the ATP, okay? We get a lot of it, though. 36 is a lot, and you'll see it's way more than the other two, but it's slow, okay? All these different things in the cycle that have to go through, but the waste products are very easy to deal with. Water, okay, slowly produces it with water, um, as a waste product, which really isn't a waste product, CO2, we just breathe it out. Very easy to handle waste products. Not a big deal at all. Anaerobic glycolytic system, the one we want to tap into later on, this is the one that causes acid. It uses glucose to produce only 2 ATP. Obviously, this is much more efficient than this one. Okay, 2 ATP molecules using enzymes in the cell cytoplasm, so you don't have to worry about all this moving things through the mitochondria. It's just floating in the cell, um, the liquid in and around the cell, it is incredibly fast. That's why your body uses it, because it is way faster than using the curb cycle, right? With lactic acid as the waste product, right? Again, your aerobic system then kind of uses that acid that moves off, and they kind of work in unison if you're not using doing this too quickly. 
Here's the one we're really dealing with here today, and this is why things are a little bit different and why this is such a short-lived energy production system. The anaerobic alactic system uses the available ATP first. Okay, good. That's gone. It's gone after about two seconds. Then something called creatine phosphate is what charges the alactic system, okay, to produce, again, two molecules of ATP using enzymes in the cell cytoplasm just like that. It's different enzymes. It's different um, way of moving the, phosphor, uh, the phosphate over. Little to no waste product. So here's the thing. The idea of phosphate, creatine phosphate, it takes the phosphate from the creatine phosphate, and that's how it quickly recharges the ATP. It is the fastest way of recharging ATP. ATP sitting in your muscles is the fastest energy because it doesn't have to do anything. Then the creatine phosphate system, because it's got these phosphates that just easily splits, takes and puts it back on the ATP. This is the next fastest, but your body can only do it for about six to seven seconds. That's, again, why it's a bigger contributing energy factor in those shorter races. And why we're not really dealing with this with energy, I'm just explaining this to show you how this all, how this energy system is very different from this energy system, even though they're both anaerobic. Okay, then when this is tapped out after about six to seven seconds, your body starts using this. The... the it's not that they turn on and off, it's just this one takes a little bit longer to get going. This one takes much longer to get going. So the idea being is your body uses the ATP. When that's gone after two seconds, it goes to the alactic system. And then it goes to the anaerobic glycolytic system, anaerobic system. This one is still being used. It can kind of recharge itself at sub-maximal paces, which is why you can have kind of a kick at the end and that kind of thing also. Um, so that's the idea. This is the fastest way of recharging the ATP and why it's sometimes called free energy because it recharges very readily and I'll show you how you recharge it throughout the, um, throughout the workout with these short bursts with long rest and with very little waste product because your body resynthesizes the creatine phosphate um, as long as you give it enough rest. So that is all the, the setup here, um, all the biology refresher, or maybe first time you've kind of seen it in, in that kind of depth um, of how this all sort of works. But I hope that truly kind of shows you that even though these are both anaerobic, this is very different from this, right? This is longer lasting produces energy in a different way even though it's without oxygen and it produces this waste product that can hurt the aerobic system if exposed to too often and too early this that waste product is not involved and it's why the whole name of the game is different and it's why this because it is so fast so readily available to produce energy for you why we get this different training response with the muscle elasticity we talked about earlier on all right, so in previous videos, we've, I've shown you how to set up your paces for your workouts by using your VO2 max um, testing. Um, descriptions down below for all that. So how can we set up paces for our alactic work? It's pretty simple. Run fast as fast as you can. That's really what this comes down to. Um, as mentioned, this is the fastest free energy system you have. If you're not running fast, you're not training the alactic system. And again, it's not really for us about training the alactic system, but what you get while training the alactic system all of the force production we've talked about, that muscle elasticity, the reduction in ground contact time, all of those things that we're trying to get while training this system. You have to run fast, as fast as you can. It's pretty simple. We're sprinters today. Just said it. We're sprinters today. There, there is not any kind of middle ground for this. If these aren't done at max effort, you aren't training the alactic system. It's very, very simple. Fast as you can. So what are some of the workouts you can do to train this energy system? Just like before, um, these are important, not critical. So you're going to try to get one in every microcycle in general prep. Generally, I would say general prep, a microcycle is about every week. But it may or may not ever ha it may not happen. But you definitely want to get one at least every other microcycle in general prep. Uh, the suggestion is about 20 of these sessions, 20 to 25 per year. So you want to get about two to three per month. The idea being certain times you might not do this the very end of your season. When you're not running, you're going to get, uh, you're obviously not going to be doing these, but that's the idea. In the general prep, one per microcycle or at the very least every other microcycle. This is something you can interchange with another workout I'm going to be showing you um, in the next video series about short hill intervals, um, but that's the idea. These should be done pretty regularly. They are important workouts. Um, maybe every microcycle in specific prep and pre-comp, like I said, as they get a little bit more specific to what you're doing, maybe in the, the mid part or late mid part of your year. All right, so fly repetitions, all right? In the last video, um, I talked to you guys about intervals, the idea of incomplete rest 
by doing bouts of fast work with incomplete recovery. That's the interval, the rest period. The only difference with repetitions is meaning meaning it's full recovery. Okay, repetitions and intervals are the same basic idea. You have fast bouts of work with a rest period. Intervals are incomplete rest. Repetitions are almost full recovery. Okay, you do these later in the training year with some of your aerobic workouts like VO2 max and your speed workouts for the glycolytic system. Um, but with repetition, I mean, excuse me, with uh, the alactic system, you always have to work repetitions and I'll explain why in a second here. So, meaning full recovery, um, allow for larger amounts of high intensity work. Bouts of work are going to be very short. Again, this is a short-lived energy system. It only lasts about six, uh, six to seven seconds. 20 to 60 meters fly-ins are going to have, obviously, a fly-in. I have some examples of this that I can show you. Um, the way that I would have you do this, or I, I do it, you can do it however you want, and I'll show you an example, and you'll see it done just this way in the videos. You have your cones that mark a fly-in. So you've got your starting line. Typically what I do is if the wind is not blowing right in their face, we'll go to the 110 um, hurdle starts on the track, and then it's obviously 10 meters to the 100 meter and 100 meter hurdle start. And we start there, and then I have a cone at that second line. And for those 10 meters, they're flying in, they're accelerating. The idea being that you're going to be as close to full speed as you can after 10 meters. Obviously, you're not at full speed there, but you've flown in. So for 10 meters, then you have the rep, whatever this length you want to do. Okay, and then a deceleration zone, I would recommend 20 meters. You do not want them hitting the brakes as hard as they can, as fast as they can. That's where you actually see the potential for um, issues in here. It's not in going fast in the middle for the rep, whatever distance you choose here. It's people slam on the brakes. So you've got your first cone that marks the end of the fly-in and the start of the rep. You've got another cone that marks the beginning of the rep and the end of the rep. And then a third cone that marks the end of the deceleration zone and really preach that idea of slowly decelerate. Use the whole deceleration zone if you can. If they have problems the next day with my quads are hurting and that kind of thing, they probably slammed on the brakes too much. If it's a speed muscle, like a hamstring kind of thing, then it might be that they just got a lot out of it or they're not quite used to it yet. But quads are usually more for braking and if they have, and it's used for more aerobic type running. Um, this is the biggest thing. Make sure they're using the slow 20 meters to decelerate, okay? Personally, and I'll have the personal note sort of in the, I'll mark it um, as personally, the way I do it is I like fly 30 meters, okay? Because you get a lot out of 30 meters. I showed you that slide earlier from the Matter and Hartman study that showed that it was 80% um, working this energy system. So it's really training exactly what you want. As you go a little bit longer, you're de-emphasizing the alactic system. You're starting to get a little more from the glycolytic system, which we don't necessarily want to do. I think that this is the safest way to do it with your distance kids, okay? So the idea would be a 10 meter fly-in, a fly 30 meters, so 30 meters of the cone, and then a deceleration zone. So if you add this all up, it ends up being 60 meters. To me, that means that the whole time, there's no way they should be really tapping much into that glycolytic system because they're going to be accelerating. So that's obviously part of the six to seven seconds. They've got their 30 meters where they're going very fast, and then they're decelerating. So by the end, they're really not cranking the system up but the idea being is if they were to go crazy and be full speed and and not decelerate fast and they're going for it's just kind of a safe way for distance kids to get speed i think when you start stretching this out to 40 meters or 50 meters there was a point where i would do fly 50 meters i think you're just asking for trouble um i think you're just asking for a distance kid it would be it's great for your sprinters but for your distance kid i think this is the safest way to do your fly 30s is how i always 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 do this workout but you can play around with it maybe try something shorter to get used to it maybe if you have some kids that have been doing this for you maybe you can extend it out however you want to do it so fly repetitions okay the rest must be extensive three to four minutes here's the reason why that glut that uh, anaerobic alactic system that we talked about previously the one that is for free energy but is short-lived it recharges 80 percent of the creatine phosphate in three minutes okay so for the most part, you're going to get this mostly done. Again, the reason why I do fly 30s is I give them between three and four minutes. The idea being it's between 80 and say maybe 85% of the creatine phosphate has resynthesized. I can go fast again, and I don't have to try and tap into the anaerobic glycolytic system to go really fast here. That would be bad. If you gave them a minute in between, which distance coaches tend to try and be really harsh on, on rest. You see sprint coaches just let their kids rest forever, and you got to take that approach. It's going to be a little bit more so. 
the idea being is if you give them too little rest, well, now they're not training the alactic system anymore. Now they are training the glycolytic system, and it comes with all those potential negatives of the acid increasing. You can um, hurt aerobic um, development a little bit here, and you can start the peak of that window that we don't want. So give them, at the very least, three minutes. They start the rep, start your watch, however you want to do it. Do not let them start the last rep until they've gotten at least three minutes. Four would be better, okay? Think like a sprint coach, okay, with this rest, okay? But what I would have you do, and the way we do this, and you'll see this in, in the video, is we set these up, like I said, at the 100, 110 hurdle start. We do it. We do our 10 meter flying, 30 meters really fast, decelerate, and then basically kind of go all the way around the track afterwards as you're going through, trying to draw this here as best you can. So they go through their fast part on the one side, and they just easy jog on the recovery all the way around the track, really easy, really easy, really easy, all the way through. And by the time they get back, maybe you have them get water wherever you have your, your water station. That's perfectly fine, but they keep moving, keep moving, keep moving, and then they hit it. And the idea being is... If you keep this going and you do as many as I'm going to kind of specify here, you can get a decent amount of volume in on these days too with some active recovery. And again, the idea being is from the previous videos we said, if your heart rate doesn't drop all that much, if it doesn't go really below 120 for any long period of time, it's aerobic development. That other type of running economy we talked about and just aerobic um, development through all the other adaptations we've talked about on aerobic threshold recovery runs and long runs in previous videos. So use that active recovery this is something that your sprinters and your sprint coach would not do so treat them like a sprinter on the rep treat them like a sprinter in terms of the amount of rest but have them do the active recovery which works really well for your distance kids okay so pick what makes sense for your kids but i would say that you want to target from different you know things mostly from usatf you want to target about 300 to 600 meters of the alactic work on that day so that does not include the active recovery around the track but it does include the fly-in and the deceleration zone for the most part so the idea being is if each of these you add in the 10 and the 20 to it so we got 60 meters you can do up to about 10 of these um a day and get um get what you need out of it so if you do um the 300 meters that means you're probably going to do about five i usually start off with about maybe six and on a normal day we're in the middle of the season we do eight to ten um, the first bunch of them, and I'll show this in the video, the first bunch of them we kind of all do together, say the first eight, and then um, I'll time the last one, and I'll explain that a little bit more. So that includes that, so 300 to 600 meters of work of the alactic um, type work, okay? So again, the danger point here, I should have clicked that before just to kind of repoint it out. The rest has to be extensive. Make sure you give them the rest so that you're not tapping into the um, acid-producing energy system. You can also do static starts um, with repetitions. The idea being is you don't have the fly-in. Everything is the same apart from you're starting the rep from a static start. This is what your sprinters are doing when they're doing block works or just you know stationary. Start. They're trying to accelerate a little bit more so, okay? This does increase the difficulty of the work, but it also increases the potential for something to go wrong, okay? Especially when you're dealing with distance kids that are not usually used to doing this type of thing. So, personally, I do not do this as I don't think it's really a specific for the 5K. Again, we're not really working on accelerating. We're working on training the alactic system as an ends to another mean that muscle um, elasticity, the the running um, economy we're talking about. So, because I'm not dealing with a short sprint um, race where acceleration is key, a lot of times you want them to start slowly in the 5K, not burn out. I don't think it's specific enough to warrant trying to do static starts with repetitions, but you could. You would still be training the alactic system, okay? I just think that the potential negatives don't outweigh the positives. So for both of these, whichever one you do, the flies or the static starts, for either type, I would try and track progress by recording the last rep of the day, okay? And I'll show you an example of that. So the idea being is, as I mentioned, we have about eight. Um, we do about 8 to 10 when we're really rocking with this. We'll do the first 8 all together, and you'll see that. And then at the end, 9 or 10, we kind of do it. And they kind of know what their PR is, and we kind of make a little competition about it at the end. And you'll see they'll be going one at a time, and that's the one I'm recording, the last rep of the day. Okay? The idea being is with a 5K kid, we do need them to be able to, you know, when they have a little bit on them, call on this energy system for that final kick more so than the opening surge that you see in, like, the, the 100 meters. So... Um, that's something that's kind of important. So that's where you'll see a kind of change, and then I'll show you the actual, um, the actual, how you can track that progress throughout time. 
okay? These are highest intensity possible, but there is no real waste product developed. We talked about that. This is almost free energy. Fatigue is in using all the available creatine phosphate, and when the phosphate is creatine phosphate is gone, then it goes to another energy system. That's the fatigue in this energy system, okay? And as we said, this lasts about three to four minutes, all right? And the other fatigue is to the central nervous system. There are a lot of contacts here. You're asking a lot of your central nervous system to send all of these um, these neurotransmitters, the different things that are being fired through all these different um, nerve endings, okay? So just like in the long run, it's only 12 to 24 hours. So it's weird. This is the exact opposite. We looked at our energy continuum. You've got the long runs, the recovery runs that are slow, but a lot of volume off to the, when you're looking at the screen, the right. And then this is the exact opposite off to the left, right? It's high intensity, but it's low volume for the actual work. And because they are completely different, they're not really trained, they're not high volume, high intensity like the VO2 max. It's why it has this relatively short window of recovery, 12 to 24 hours. The first time you do this, they're going to be sore. Second time, they might be a little bit sore. But once you've been doing this for a while, my kids can do this the day after something hard. Like we might do a VO2 max interval day and come back and do this the next day. You can do this. You know, I wouldn't necessarily do this the day before a race, um, but you could if you wanted to once they're kind of in shape with it. We'll typically do this on a Thursday and race on a Saturday. Um, there's no problem with that at all. You can do this and do a tempo run the next day. This is a 24-hour recovery. So this does make sequencing really easy. So we talk about this being important, not critical, but I can get this in no matter where I need to. So that's what really makes it kind of um, interesting and really nice to be able to get this in your training cycle. So before I show you guys an example of what this looks like from an actual workout that we did, let's see how we can se sequence this into our fictitious, fictitious um, training year, all right? So this is general prep here in June. Again, fictitious because I don't know how things are with you and your state. I can't work with any of my kids in any way, shape, or form. I'm just not deemed safe at this point. So, And I can't tell them what to do on their own either. So this is totally fictitious. It's simply based on best case scenario if we had started the um, last week of May, where they'd be doing some easy stuff, maybe on their own or whatever, building up to where our state meet is in Florida, which is November 7th. You might want to change that around, but the way I have it, it's a 23-week macro cycle or season, and we're just looking at general prep, which would include that last week of May as like a transitionary week from no to little activity to starting up again. June, July, and the beginning of August, it's an 11-week general preparation phase. Really, it's 12 weeks if you add in that extra one. So, this is week one. You'll see all the other workouts that we've already talked about sequence in here. We've got two recovery runs in week one, another recovery run, a long run, and then we've got an alactic um, fly 30s here in week one of general prep. Yep, you do this through the entire year, and you'll see you're going to get three in a month. As you can see, it's pretty much every other week, as we get a little bit later on, it might be a little bit more so. I'll show you pairing this up with a long run. We kind of talked about how you can do this, but why you would want to do this here when we get back to it. Um, don't have it here in week two. There's a couple other things I told you about short hills that might kind of fit into some of these other blanks that you see here. Got an alactic fly 30, alactic fly 30. I said I would do probably six or so on this first one. Um, especially if you have brand new kids that have never done it before, maybe build it up to seven or eight here and then be at eight to 10 maybe by your third one. It's not um, too, too crazy to, to build it up that quickly. And then kind of go back so you can see it. So we had one here in this week, the last week, uh, week five. So that's right here. And so now we do have a week where we've gone back to back. Okay. I'll talk about, I said hill runs kind of get you the same thing. There's this idea of having hills and then going away from them. So this kind of pairs nice that we've got one, two, three weeks in a row of fly 30s and then we don't have it for a week and then there will be one here in August. So we don't get too far away from it. We never go more than one week, uh, or excuse me, two microcycles without doing one, but there's nothing wrong with doing them on back-to-back -back weeks either. That is perfectly fine. We've got two weeks here where we're back-to-back, -back, then we don't have one, and then we've actually got three weeks where we've got them back-to-back. So it's really easy to get these in. As you'll notice, um, I don't know especially what I have here, but I've got a long run here recovery run. I've got a long run here. We'll kind of see how that all pairs up and, and um, all kind of takes place. So here is um, a video from an actual um, workout where we did this. This was during the track season, but it's all the same thing. This was a day where it was obviously must have been really windy because our normal 110 meter start is down here and we'd be going the other way. So I must have flipped this around um, because of wind. You don't really want to do this into the wind. Um, again, max intensity is better to use the wind if you can um, on these days. So you just kind of see the way it works. Um, they're going, I think, maybe eight across here. They're kind of making it into a competition. You can see Cone to 
fly into right there. That starts the rep to a cone, and there's something else marking it down here. And you'll see I kind of give them the liberty to... I tell them you can start, and then I let them kind of start their own groups. One person kind of takes over um, with it here. As they're kind of going through as fast as possible. Someone got the GoPro. We're in the deceleration zone here. And now they're just going to start slowly going around. I'm saying I just told them we're ready for the three minutes is up. And then boom, there they go. Next group's out. Next group is out. And it all just kind of works its way out. They start to slow down, decelerate. So that's how they do it for about eight, the first eight. And then this is where I'm going to be going through. And I've got this in slow motion, obviously. I've got this in, hang on. Sounds funny in slow motion, so I'm not going to do that. Um, in slow motion as they come through. And I'm measuring this one. Here it is in full speed. That is Jared when we get to the actual results. Here's one of our short mid-distance runners coming through it. Again, we've got the same setup sort of going. Just one more time in slow motion as he comes through. This is actually a good thing if you wanted to kind of look at mechanics, especially if you've got like a 400 meter runner that you're trying to do it. You can really look at trail and things like that as we are going through. So that's how it all sort of looks as we go through the workout. And here's how you can track this throughout the year. So you can see we did them pretty regularly in the track season here. December 14th, 31st, all the way through here. Um, I guess this was on February 19th we were doing it. Um, I kind of go in and I figure out where is their PR from maybe a previous year if they've done it. I just mark where their PR is. And you're kind of looking for trends, right? You're looking for um, are they kind of gradually going down? Because the difference between, obviously, the difference on a day like this, so like 3.4 to 3.36 on a hand time, that's probably me as much as anything. But you're kind of looking and generally, they're starting um, the season and where they are finishing the season. So this person was, normally, David was in the 3.4s, and he's ending in the 3.3s by the, well, this was the midpoint of the season. Okay, so it's kind of just looking at general trends as you're going... All right, so I mentioned um, I was going to talk to you, and this will be the last um, thing we'll chat about here, is how this kind of pairs great with some other things, the long run and things like that. So what can we do here? This pairs great with a long cool down, okay? So going three to four miles at an easy pace, just like you would on some of the other cool downs I've mentioned on like your VO2 max or your uh, tests or intervals. I talk about doing three to four miles afterwards. And when you're doing it, ne not necessarily at their aerobic threshold or easy pace, but try to do it more on feel or maybe heart rate so you get some general aerobic benefits we've talked about 20 plus minutes is what you want and you'll definitely get that by going um this sort of uh, uh distance afterwards okay it's going to add to the overall aerobic development okay so when i told you this this is short and fast for the actual core part of it the alactic part of it but you can have different things that you're training different training blocks in the whole thing so when you add in the fact that you have maybe a mile or a mile and a half or two mile whatever your warm-up is you add that in then you've got your fly 30 rep and then the jog all the way around if you're doing 10 of these well that ends up being two and a half miles or so if you're doing all those and then you've got three to four miles on the back and typically when we do this we get eight to nine miles easy i'm just easy it's not your sort of typical way of doing it but there's some pretty continuous nature of this if you're doing it quickly with the with the fly work and they're going all the way around and then you try to get them right into this recovery if you can you're not really losing a lot of aerobic development. And that's one of the things that coaches worry about. It's like, how can I dedicate a day just to A-lactic? Well, you're not. You dedicated the first half of the day to a to a the day to a lactic and now the second half of the day, you're getting three to four miles. Um, that's 30, 35 minutes um, overall, something like that. Um, if you have kids or, or um, like we had um, pretty high-level girls that were working with us, I kind of figure out, all right, the boys are going to take it for doing four miles about 30 to 35 minutes. I tell the girls um, or maybe this, those uh, sort of lesser trained boys at that point to do the same thing about 35 minutes, something like that. Um, that way you know you've got 15 extra minutes of aerobic development more than the 20 minutes that you had. So that's, that's a kind of a great way to get some extra work. This is fine to do the long cool down, okay? 
as long as it's on the back end. If you start overthinking this as a distance coach and think, well, I'm going to do this first, and then I'm going to come back when they're tired, and I'm going to force them to go fast, you will not get the alactic work. Alactic work is not doing strides afterwards. We talked about this in a, a previous video about why you stride. Striding is important, but it is not speed development, and it is certainly not alactic work. Absolutely not. This has to be your highest intensity. Has to be done when you're fresh. To train speed, it must be at the front end of the practice session when you are fresh, right after your your warm-up or maybe you have some other sort of plyometric drills that you're doing that I'll talk about later on. Do this in this order with the long cooldown. You'll get the best of both worlds. You get the alactic work, and if you're worried about wasting a day, you still have some pretty good volume. Eight to nine miles, that's a pretty good day in terms of volume for, for your top end boys. All right, so long run the next day or um, or the day before. My personal preference is long run the day before. I love doing it this way. The reason being, this works the complete opposite energy system. We talked about this. These are both 24-hour recovery. So sometimes it gets hard to do this because these are two easy days. You might want to try and sequence some harder things in. But during this part of the year, I like to always go long run, fly 30s when I can. Long run, fly 30s. Long run, fly 30s. Just because it's it's just totally changing the whole game for them. It's getting them fast running, changing the whole name of the game, really getting them to work completely different energy systems, okay? And I'll do a whole, whole video, I think, on just sequencing workouts and how you put things together between 48-hour recovery, 24-hour recovery. Really, the secret to sequencing workouts is not about easy day, hard day. You hear that all the time, easy day, hard day, easy day, hard day. It's really about mixing up what energy systems you are stressing and resting. Long run, the day before, you're really stressing the aerobic system pretty hard and the central nervous system, right? You're coming back the next day and you're stressing the alactic system and a different element of your central nervous system. Yes, that's the same fatigue, but how it's being fatigued is different. If you're stressing the glycolytic system, you don't want to come back and stress the glycolytic system again. So that's really what this is about. And I think, you know, it's, it's sort of easy for people to think easy day, hard day, but really that's not the name of it. You really want to think about training different energy systems when you're sequencing these things in order. Lifting is great to be pairing with an alactic day. Um, the acceleration work, and that's really what a fly 30 is, is all about power. Okay, This is all power related. This is especially good for a particular type of lifting when you have quick, um, quick reps with fairly high weight done quickly. So you've got, you know, these are like what you call your power type of lifts. Um, you go out and you figure out what your maximum lift is. Um, this is not going to. This is not a video about lifting, but just very briefly, you've got like 90% of your your max, and you do maybe four reps, six reps at the most, very quickly. You're not sitting there and you're just stressing to push it really slowly up, like you see sometimes people when they're doing bench press and they're trying to max out, and it's all slow, 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 slow. That's not what we're really looking. We want fast, quick powerful just like the alactic run right the alactic run is some of the best strength work you can do because you're going so fast you're getting so much of your body weight pushing down on you it's like five times your body weight for every step when you're doing alactic work and that's what you want to think with this type of lifting if you're going to pair with it quick powerful quick powerful quick powerful just like the rep and that's what you really want to kind of look with if you're going to pair lifting if you're trying to do things like 70 75 percent of your max with 10 to 12 um 10 to 12 reps and then short rest in between that's not really helping accentuate what we're doing here and also when you're doing it in between your sets you're giving a lot of rest just like you're giving them in between their reps for their um in between the reps for the fly 30s maybe you're doing three sets of four at a pretty high weight quickly and then you're giving them five minutes in between something like that basically you're resetting the alactic system as i mentioned uh, before uh plyometric exercises are also great um, we talked about alactic runs are essentially plyometric, um, so this kind of adds into it if you're one that wants to use plyometrics. I definitely think there's benefit to it in, in increasing the elasticity and the free energy that your kid's muscles can get from this type of work. So especially short plyometric work done before the fly 30 starts. So these are even shorter, more explosive kind of works in the fly 30, so you want to kind of go in that. So this is the only other thing that you would probably put, and I mentioned about like drills, Basically, make this part of your warm-up if you're going to do it on your um, alactic day, right? So before Fly 30 starts, you got this works the same type of central nervous system, muscle coordination, synchronization, and muscle elasticity we're going for in this day. So if you're one that uses plyometrics, pair them with your alactic day. I will say, though, these days take a long time. 
typically I have to plan out about two and a half hours just for um, the warm up, the short plyometrics, the alactic stuff, and the cool down. Not this doesn't even add in the lifting, which I typically have them do on their own. Fortunately, we're in a situation where a lot of the kids have them in their neighborhood, so I don't have to worry about that. Um, trying to keep them for three hours at school and three hours is just way too much. I, I would not want to do that. So these days take a minute. They take a big minute actually when you're doing it. So make sure you're planning accordingly. And really it's because of all the rest that you just have to get them, but you have to give it to them. Remember, that's a danger point from earlier on. Um, just plan for it. Make sure that you've got enough time. If it's a day when you've got kids that need to leave for, for church or work or something like that on a regular basis, try and make this on a day that you can kind of devote more time to it. What we do is a lot of times we'll do this on Monday if we can because our school gets out an hour early on Mondays, so it kind of works out nicely that um, as long as I don't have a meeting or something or I can have them start the warm-up and then meet them afterwards, that um, they're, not, they're not being asked to spend a ton of time there or it's not taking as much out of the day as you can possibly handle so just that's one thing to worry about on this is they do take a decent amount of time but they're e easy to sequence as you saw as we looked at it before so um, if you like this video I hope you like this video the first one on the important workouts for cross country in the general preparation phase if you did please leave it a like um, as I mentioned before also if you uh, if you find this content helpful please think about hitting the subscribe button I would really really appreciate that um, if you think there's other people that might benefit from it I'd love for um, you to share it around also if you have any questions or comments please Please ask them in the um, comments down below. I've got some videos down below that I reference in the video that you might want to check out also. Um, the next video I'm going to do, the one that kind of is very similar to this, is short hill intervals. The next thing I'll be doing in terms of workout types. Um, so look for that in the next day or two. Um, and until next time, this has been Coachy TV.